I am uh, really excited to be here today as we continue to evolve our Special Operations Forces because I really want to hear the thoughts and questions that this distinguished group of both thought leaders and practitioners and those just in the general public that we serve, um, although student general public, I guess, uh, the academic general public that we serve have. So I'm going to try to leave time for questions at the end and then happy to talk to folks in the intervening moments in the breaks, um, in the breakout sessions as that's useful. As we think about SOFT's role in the 2022 NDS, I want to start sort of towards the end of that document where I don't think a lot of people start, which is in the force planning section. And I'll read you the quote, but it says, the joint force must be shaped to ensure the ability to respond to small scale short duration crises without substantially impacting high end warfighting readiness. And the reason I start there is because that shaping is really to us about the continued use and the potential growth of our special operations forces. When you think about what history shows us, when we are designing our military for high-end conflict, at the end of the day, attrition-based warfare does not fare well in small-scale contingencies and crises. And so that is what is in SOF's DNA. SOF was designed in World War II to fill that niche and then has grown since then and evolved its capabilities. So it's part of our heritage, it's part of our skill set. We have five core missions as we think about them in the sort of broader terms. One is contributing to war fighting advantage. One is campaigning. Then there are the, the three Cs, counter VEO, crisis response, and counter WMD. Those last three are what I would put in part of what the NDS terms, other persistent threats. SOF will continue to use its expertise to handle those kinds of threats so that the larger joint force can do the first part of the NDS, to prioritize modernizing and meeting the pacing challenge of the PRC and dealing with the acute threat of Russia. So when you add campaigning into CVO, CR, as we say, CM, WMD, you realize that a fundamental role for SOF is actually also part of the underpinning of the NDS, and that is preventing strategic distraction. And I really think that's an important point for everyone to think about. When you think about the last 20 years, when we became such experts in CT and CBO, because we're so good at crisis response. But that still meant that the larger enterprise really focused on that mission set and pulled us away from some of the evolutions that we saw as the PRC developed some of its technology, as we saw Russia becoming increasingly um, aggressive. So with that understanding, and also I would say with the understanding that we do all of that today at less than 2%, approximately 1.7% of DOD's budget. So to me, that is exactly what we're talking about when we say we need to have the ability to handle those small scale contingencies um, and respond to those short duration crises without diverting the larger joint force. The joint force can only modernize if we are successful in preventing those strategic distractions. So that underpinning is there. If we then look at what we do in the three core NDS directed means, how are we going to win this decisive decade? I wanna talk a little bit about each of those. Integrated deterrence, campaigning, building enduring advantage. Those are our three lines of effort under the NDS. If you think about integrated deterrence, it is again something that is, I think, second nature to SOF. We build high-functioning, cross-functional teams all the time. They are interagency most of the time. They involve foreign partners. Um, and what we do with that is we try to create strategic impact with tactical excellence. But we also provide that platform and that convening ability. That's something that carries into integrated deterrence. That is gonna give us options and give our national decision makers options in this next decade. We also don't just convene, but we enable our interagency partners in many cases and our foreign partners. Um, one really interesting example of an area where we're trying to increase capability and where we think there's a lot of room is if you think about what I'll call irregular warfare medicine. Um, and IW medicine is about making sure that in remote, hard to reach areas, there's medical capability. That creates resiliency for a civilian population, but also for a military that may not be as capable. Makes them more willing to fight if they believe they have access to care, and it's particularly urgent and acute care. So that's a good example of where we can enable our partners by just training them in a very specific enabler as well. And then, as you all know, the lead up to that is we provide some of that enabling usually in sort of as they're learning. Um, Another example of how we bring everything together and perform high-functioning, high cross-functional teams is a term I think many of you are probably familiar with, which is the triad concept. And that is something that USASOC, our Army Special Forces folks, have come to come up with 
primarily, but it applies to everybody, which is the cyberspace soft triad. And the reason that's interesting is not because it's actually a, a really different way for soft to operate. It has more to do with the fact that people don't think of those things together. They think they're all distinctly different, right? Like we're supposed to be in the desert where there is no electricity, so why would we be talking about cyber and space, right? How's that supposed to work? Um, and it's really because of our placement and access. So our placement and access can enable cyber and space operations. So we allow us to go to a, we take existing capabilities, bring them together, and then make them more than the sum of their parts because, again, of our tactical excellence in placement and access. If you think about campaigning, this is a, a place where I would say we're going a little bit back to soft's roots in irregular warfare and unconventional warfare. We traditionally have helped shape the operating environment. We provide indicators and warning for the joint force, and that is also feeding into integrated deterrence as well. We create dilemmas for adversaries, and this is a really interesting place where I think in some ways the sky is the limit for soft. Because we are tailorable, scalable, because we can do things at a, at a smaller level, our ability to essentially make mischief globally, to make our adversaries have to look left when they want to be staring right, is infinite. It's really a matter of how much we're willing to do and where we're willing to do it. But our adversaries are looking globally. They're not just looking at the Indo-PACOM AOR. And so it's really important that we be creating dilemmas for them, both globally and in Indo-PACOM. And that's something that SOF is uniquely positioned to do. Um, and that also flows a little bit into the indicators and warning, because we're able to then get to another thing, which is help counter coercion and influence. By being present, we make it harder for our adversaries to, to win the day. I would say what we see big picture is most in the world don't want to have to make a choice. And that's okay. But what we don't want them to do is choose the PRC way. We don't want them to give the PRC unlimited access, unlimited rights. We want them to feel like they have to, at a minimum, balance. Um, where possible, we want that balance to shift to us. And by being present, in some cases, it doesn't take much. Because there is sort of a, a traditional, the Belt and Road Initiative, things like that, that increasingly other countries see through kind of both the costs and the benefits, right? When you build roads and buildings that are made with shoddy concrete and they fall down three years later, maybe you should have just waited what would probably be the full three years for the US government to approve any sort of project, right? I mean, that's, that's the dilemma. But um, what most countries do, and it's the logical choice for um, what I would call a weaker state strategy, is they try to get something from both of us because that's what they need. They need a lot. You know, they see themselves as needing a lot and they'll take from both. And they'd rather not have to choose. And again, as long as we are there on the playing field, making sure we understand when that balance would shift to our detriment, then we can keep that in balance at a minimum and over time hopefully get to our advantage. But that only happens if you're present. And only soft can be present in numbers globally. We are in 80 countries today. So our ability to see that coercion, to see the influence, and to adjust that balance, we are the force that's doing that. Um, without big mass, without creating huge new dilemmas for our host countries and, and potential partners. Um, the other thing that we do that I would say is very traditional is in our mission sets of increasing partner resilience, resistance forces, special reconnaissance, um, and partner interoperability. Like those are all classic missions that we've had from our founding, and they're ones that we're returning to now. When we then look at enduring advantage, I think that's where you see um, a really exciting time for SOF. Because when I talk about kind of using some of what we already know how to do, going back to our roots, it's about the balancing act. Um, and the second piece of that is investing in our future and investing in the now and how we rebalance. And a big piece of that is us starting to develop and align with our a joint concept for operating that builds on service-specific capabilities and really highlights those but still brings them together. And I say that because I think most of you know that over the last two decades, most soft, regardless of their service, were doing fundamentally the same mission. That's no longer the case. We need undersea to be undersea. We need people in the air to be in the air. We need, we even now are starting to have soft aligned space operators. I and mean, we are like, the whole spectrum is there. And we need people to be aligned to their service and that, again, tactical excellence has to be at the highest level of proficiency so that we can create new effects. Um, it is not about doing the same mission. And we have to build as an institution some institutional things that we didn't really have before. And 
it's tricky, I would say, and I think those of you who are operators can speak to this, but when you're doing sort of this, a huge number of reps and sets on the same mission, passing tactical knowledge to the next unit is fairly easy. You know, this unit comes off the field, here's what we learned, here's the new state of play, off to the next unit, handoff, and it keeps getting better and better and better. When you're doing a wide array of different missions in different domains and bringing multi-domains together, that learning process has to become more systemic, it has to become more institutionalized and thoughtful, and it still has to somehow be easy. <laughs> and that's, that's probably the hardest part of this. Um, and so we are looking at really interesting technologies to try to help us with machine learning and AI and how to enable the human even more because we have to do it not just for the tactical excellence, but so that operationally we're learning in these different spaces when there might be a gap of, of a year between when you run one kind of operation and do the next, or maybe two years. Um, we might have to do five other different types of operations in between. And the same force will be asked to do very different things. And that's hard, obviously. I mean, tactical proficiency partly comes from practice. Um, and so that's going to be a balancing act as we move into this new time frame where we have a really unique array of missions we think that we're going to be presented with. Because again, we're scalable, we're tailorable. We can do something that gives our national leadership options that they would not otherwise have. And we can create dilemmas that might otherwise be obvious um, who the, the, the creator of that dilemma is, and that's a goal of ours uh, every time we can do it. So we are doing this in different ways. One way that we're trying to uh, strengthen the institution is we are really focusing on something that the Deputy Secretary is very eager for us to do, which is really build our analytics and decision tools. And that sounds really boring and wonky, and I know that it kind of is, but it's vital. I mean, AI, machine learning don't get you much if you're, if you're learning, you know, how to tie your shoe and you already knew how to do that. Like, that's, that's not really helpful. We need to learn how to do the things that we don't do well today or learn where we thought we were good and it turns out we weren't having the impact we thought we were. So it's both about metrics and analytics and improving our decision tools. We are investing a lot in defendable, repeatable analytics and decision tools now um, as a soft enterprise. And that's an exciting place with wargaming, bringing soft into um, the big service war games. And many of you are familiar with, I think, the challenge that we face, which is most wargaming starts at phase three. So if our entire strategy rests on a concept of deterring, which means we didn't have the conflict, right? Um, once we're at stage three, we're in the conflict where we have to prevail, uh, we kind of lost, we, we, we failed in most of our strategy at that point. Um, our goal is obviously to win in the prevent piece. But when it comes to prevail, um, you only prevail if you've created some asymmetric advantages going in, and that's where soft can help. That's where we can create, again, not just dilemmas, but now advantages for our side. The joint force needs some of these key asymmetric advantages, and soft is positioned to build those building blocks that will give them that, um, but it's not gonna be easy, and it's, it's challenging as the entire national security community and apparatus grapples with what does it mean to intentionally compete and try to avoid the conflict. How much do we devote to, to those lines of effort and what is, what is that, the shape of that? That's an entire interagency effort. It's an entire national effort, to be honest. Um, and I think we're still finding our way a little bit there, and so that is one of our challenges because for soft to plug in, you know, we plug in kind of again in phases sort of zero to two, if you will. Once the shooting starts, we have a, very, a role, and history has shown again. No war goes off without SOF ending up having to go in um, and, and create some of those key advantages, key intelligence, um, key strategic moments. But, uh, but our focus is really on everything that happens before. And building that into the, the war games that we're doing is also pushing the joint force to think more seriously about what beyond presence and a credible military force option they bring to the table in prevent. Um, and it's... it's, it's it's a, again, it's a challenge. Um, so the other thing is, as we look at innovation, and Bill's going to talk about this a lot more than I need to, so I won't go too far in it, but there's some really exciting innovation besides AI and machine learning um, and kind of how we use data. And, you know, we have a lot of things. Um, the commander likes to talk about uh, all of our nexts. We have ISR next. We have next-gen um, mobility. I think there's a few more next-gen. We have a lot of nexts. <laughs> and that, again, just reflects the fact that we all see that where we are today is not where we have to be. This is the decisive decade, so we have to invest smartly across the spectrum. And probably the area that I personally am most interested in and in pushing us out, but that we're all doing it together as an enterprise, is the cognitive domain. I think there is so much work we can do there as we think about this whole spectrum of the cognitive domain. It's both about what we do to enhance our performance as 
the elite performers, you know, we're sort of, we think of soft as, as your elite, you know, pro athlete. How do you enhance that performance by using the cognitive domain? But then how do you apply that and how do you disable, dismantle, decrement the adversary's performance? How do you get in the adversary's decision loop? That's classic, you know, OODA loop theory. That's not, not rocket science. But it's a new enemy. How are we looking at that adversary and understanding their decision processes? If you look around academia today, I would say there's at least 20 different theories of the case for how the PRC likes to make decisions. Uh, which one's right? I don't know. But I am worried that we as an enterprise have not been able to model or really simulate enough of those options to start to refine our understanding of the dynamic that we have to be at where we test and we come back and see what did they do, what didn't they do. We're still very early in those phases and I think that is a real challenge for us. So again, I'll let um, Bill talk more about the specific innovation but it is an exciting area where I think we believe we can enable our humans and you know, from the top to the bottom, I think the one thing I can say about the soft community and enterprise is we all believe the human is far more important than the hardware or the enabling tech. It's about the innovative use of that, that that human puts that to or the, how you enable that human to be more effective. Um, but science is really moving rapidly and if we can harness that and focus it, I think we have tremendous opportunities. So again, I'll just go back to where I started, which is um, we are evolving once again as, as soft to meet the nation's challenges. I think it starts with our tactical excellence leading to strategic impact. And the first step in that for us is that underpinning to the NDS, which is preventing the strategic distractions of the joint force can modernize so that they can mobilize the way they need to, but it's also in doing our core missions and going back to our roots across those three lines of effort the NDS demands of us. And with that, I'll take questions. So for those that want to ask questions, please raise your hand. Also, on the uh, mic, for Sven, for Marie, we will be back across the room. Any questions, let's stand up. And feel free to ask, I mean, you can ask about anything you want about in terms of how things are in D.C., what my office actually does, not everyone knows that. I mean, whatever questions you have, I'm very open. I have a question. Um, thank you for your uh, talk. Um, you mentioned AI, um, and you mentioned AI in the context of operations. <clears throat> Forgive my ignorance, but like, how, 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 would that, how does that work? Yeah, so I think it comes down to um, what we see more and more, which is information overload is one piece of it. So using AI to give you um, a more digestible set of options and then sort of assessing some of the likelihood of those options because there's a piece that is warfighter experience, but again, as we go into this new era where you're not going to have the reps and sets on the same mission set, it's going to be more important to take different data sets and create the options and get a sense of your you know, you're still going to rely on warfighter kind of um, the thing that isn't science, uh, the art, but you're also going to be informed now by what the AI tells you are some of your better options or some of the opportunities. Um, it's also using the AI in much bigger back at, you know, sort of headquarters wargaming, hopefully to more effectively model and simulate and see where we can get. Um, I think those are probably two places. I don't know, Bill, you build probably some other like, thoughts too. Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I guess two things popped into my head is, uh, uh, a lot of like next generation ISR you talked about, you know, processing all that data that, uh, you know, we're collecting from an ISR perspective is just huge amounts of data. So we definitely need more advanced tools in that, that arena. And, and then the machine and the, maintenance. And the machine learning part of it. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, irregular warfare sentiment analysis, that kind of thing, you know, for our operators and, you know, in foreign countries or, you know, more hostile scenarios, just having a better understanding of the sentiment of the, the, the local population, if you will. I think that's another example, I think, where AML tools could be useful, especially using, you know, publicly avail available information, cyber tools, and those kind of things. So just a couple other examples. Pop yeah, and I would say, like, and the other thing is um, improving kind of our maintenance of our fleets. Like, the, there's a lot there that we're, we're, we're actually, with industry, which is advancing in that space a lot, <clears throat> where your sensors along with, like, your, we have much more efficient models now for how to use our, even our fleets that as they get older, we're more efficiently employing them because of AI, because we're able to, to see specifically where they're broken and not just rely on a static profile of, you know, two, two missions and then you get something or, you know, it's just not static anymore. It's more specific to the actual aircraft or other parts of our fleet. Um, so that's another kind of big area. And then we're trying to automate, it's, it's not just sort of sentiment analysis, but the, the whole spectrum of 
intelligence that we collect, because again, it's overwhelming in some cases, in some opportunities, to the degree that we can start to automate pieces of that as we, particularly in areas where we're already a little clear about the adversary, that would actually allow us to free up humans to do some other things so that you get a smaller number of humans who have to do that exploitation and analysis in some cases. Yeah. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, Sam Hussein, um, representing Periton Corporation from Washington. Can you just touch a little bit more about and tell us a little bit about the Office of uh, Strategic Capital that was just launched recently uh, at the Pentagon and how it's working out as far as engaging and bridging industry innovation and bringing it to the soft war, war fighters? I wish I could, but I cannot. Uh, so I, Bill hopefully knows more about this. Bill, He's probably this. more <laughs> firmly in Bill's name. Yeah. The only reason I jump on that, ma'am, is because they had something called the Trusted Capital Marketplace uh, a couple of years ago yeah, that they were working. That. And, uh, you know, basically what it is is a... Uh, you know, an analysis of, you know, um, venture capitalist, um, uh, uh, you know, different uh, capital sources to feed uh, um, small businesses and those kind of things that might have capability that, that, that we need, but uh, definitely want to make sure that that, that that funding is trusted, you know, to trying to build that synergy between, you know, the, the capital and the small business to what our operators need. So that whole chain of, of security, uh, you know, is the intent of that. So. I don't think that the um, strategic capital office, I haven't seen anything huge out of that yet, but I think it's the same intent. That's not much of an answer. It's a, it's, it's a little bit nascent, but that's the same intent. So. All right, we have time for one more question, and uh, it's going to come from uh, Ms. Amaskai in the back. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for coming. You mentioned cogni cognitive ability. So my question is, you know, you come to university like Yale, how are you going to attract the brightest and best students in the country to want to pursue a career in the military, let alone special forces? So it's an interesting challenge because I actually think we have so much of what we hear America's youth wants today. And special forces actually has it sort of in spades, I would say. Um, so when people want meaningful work, they want uh, in a working environment where their bosses, people care about them as a whole person. They want to make a difference. They want to be part of a team. All of that we offer along with healthcare benefits, everything that you don't get in the private sector. So in our world, I mean, we've actually like really ramped this up even. Um, like NSW does this amazing um, thing where I think it's every six months now, and it's only been about two years you've been doing this. but. Like at every echelon level, the commander has to meet with their formation, every single individual, with themselves, the chaplain, somebody else and somebody else present, the doc, everybody, to literally find out how are you doing specifically. Tell me what's going on in your life, how's your family, how are your finances, how's your health, are you feeling okay mentally, are you stressed? And then from that, you get specific referrals to whatever will help make your life better. And there are no disciplinary or professional sort of career consequences. That happens every six months at each echelon that has to happen. And so that investment in the person is something that I hear young people craving. Somebody wanting to mentor them, to grow them, to help them be more effective, to, to give them that support, to have a community that cares. Um, so I really think our storyline is actually great. And then we also, in special operations, literally tackle the hardest problems. Right? The wicked hard problems are what we're trying to do, to be the best. And so it actually, I think, is a little, we struggle with, I guess, the marketing of it because it's very clear it's not working at this point. But I think the story we have to tell is fantastic. And if we could tell it more effectively in the spaces where young people are talking and listening, I think we have a real opportunity. Um, now, we do draw from the general force. And I will say, I think the other thing is, and we're talking about this in the Pentagon, how do we modify, reinvigorate, revamp the contracts we make, right? So if you're in the Army and you come into the Army and what you really, really love to do is sit at your computer and do cyber operations and you really don't like marching through the woods, you have zero interest in the outdoors, right? I still want your cyber talent. How do I build pathways where you can come in and out, where you learn enough and understand you can't be a drain on the force? But there's a lot of operations we now do based here in the US that enable our forward operators. How do we honestly admit that, 
bring that into the force successfully, and then grow that. And so there is a challenge as we sort of have to reimagine some of the contracts we make with America's youth because there's a piece that is absolutely always going to be about you have to be physically fit, you have to be able to perform in high stress environments forward. But there is a growing piece of our work that actually happens back here where there's still stress, but it is very different. You don't necessarily need exactly the same things that I think people think you need for the military career to be successful. And can we also make it so that you can come in and out? Three years you're in giving me your best. Then you go out for three years. You learn from industry. You do the things you like to do there. But then we can bring you back. Right now, in some cases, we have very arbitrary time limits on that and age limits that given as we age as a population, as we're healthier, and as, as some of our jobs really aren't that stressful, you know, people wouldn't have to, like, why do we say that's the age you can't do it anymore for the nation? So I do think there's a little bit of, there's conversations about that. It's, it, that is an extremely hard problem, I will say, um, because I will also, I mean, no surprise, to produce the military that we've produced over the years, Taking risk when you know one thing works is really hard because you're putting people's lives on the line potentially. And so big army is going to have a hard, hard, hard time reimagining this contract. But they know they have to. And so they're, they're thinking about it. They're talking about it. Around the margins, they're starting to do it. But I think that's the other piece of it. I think we have a great story to tell, but we also need our foundational services to be able to tell a story that's a little different to America's youth, I think. Is that it? And with that, please join me in thanking Desi Logan for her presentation.